Hello and welcome. Today we are going through the Art of Reasoning, Chapter 3, Propositions. Now, we've already actually covered a number of uh, the ideas here in our Chapter 2 video. That's because the book sort of builds very slowly to make sure that you're getting all the ideas um, before they uh, expand on them. Let's put it that way. So, what are propositions? Propositions are the sort of meaning that is supposed to be part of the sentences that we're using. And not just sentences, but sort of conveying the, uh, the, the meaning of ideas that we're trying to get across. So, in, uh, in part one, we learn about the subject and the predicate, which is essentially the, the, the who and what is it doing. Uh, I guess you can think of it as a who or what. Um, because both of those work equally well. Uh, and then the what is there. So subject is your who or what. And the predicate is a sort of uh, what's it doing. Right, so Bob went to school. The school was closed. In this case, what, what is the school doing? Well, the school is being closed, so to speak. And uh, we need both of these in order to have a, uh, a meaning to, to a sentence. Now, obviously, when we communicate, sometimes we give uh, one word answers. Uh, somebody asks you, where, where were you today? And you answer with something like, school. What you mean is, I was at school. And we can understand that pretty uh, easily. And so it ends up that there is, in fact, a subject and a predicate even in a one word answer like that, except that the subject is uh, implied in that case. Or if somebody says, who ate the cookies? And you say, uh, me then uh, the subject is given and the predicate is inferred, right? Uh, then we have questions of connotations, and I'm sure you've seen these sorts of things before. Really, uh, connotations are all about what these specific words are getting across, as well as uh, uh, sort of how grammar is going to affect things. So commonly we see this line, um, it's sort of an Old Testament line, right? Thou shall not. Now we normally we actually translate it as kill, uh, but it really should be murder. Right? And uh, we talked about this in one of the other lectures, right? The word kill has one sort of set of connotations, the word murder has a different set of connotations. So meaning that it, it taps into a different subset of ideas that are related to it than the, uh, than the word kill. So that's pretty straightforward metaphors. Uh, we talked about those last session. Uh, propositions and grammar. Um, if you're not the sort of person who worries about grammar, this uh, should hopefully get you caring about grammar a bit more. The order of the words, the punctuation that we use, all of these things are designed to clarify ideas. And if you get your words out of order, or if you uh, if you use punctuation incorrectly, you end up with a completely different meaning to, to a sentence. Uh, if you do enough logic, you turn into one of those people who can't write a text message without putting in all the punctuation. Uh, that would be me. So, for example, if we look at a phrase like, uh, this is my only car, right? A sentence like that means something like, uh, there is a car, right? Because this is a car. So, there is this thing that is a car. Uh, it is a car that belongs to me. And uh, this is uh, oh, sorry, only this car 
is a card that belongs to me, right? And so this is now the, the third set of, uh, of meanings. But if we just change that word order up a little, you are getting something completely different. So you get uh, this is only my car. So you still have the this is a car kind of uh, connection here. Uh, you have the my car, that connection is still there. But now this word only isn't connected to the word car. It's connected to the ownership, right? So I am the only owner of this car, right? Instead of this is the only car that I happen to own, now I'm saying something about the ownership of the car down here. And only all we did is we switched uh, two words around. Didn't even need to change any uh, conjugation or anything. So you have things like that. You have. Uh, Uh, let's see, Bob ate children, right? So Bob is a cannibal. Um, there is our subject, there is a verb, and then this together becomes our predicate. So Bob ate, what did he eat? Well, he ate children. So at, the, at this point, we can conclude that Bob is a cannibal. But add a little bit of punctuation and the whole thing changes, right? So Bob eight comma children. And now what happens is we still have our subject and we still have a verb. In fact, this is the, uh, the um, this would be the, the, the predicate for Bob. But you see this comma right here. We put that comma in front of a term like this when this is who we are talking to. So this is actually our subject, and then this becomes the predicate. All right, so we are talking to the children, and we are telling them what happened. Uh, so all of a sudden, Bob is no longer a cannibal. In fact, we have no idea what it is that Bob ate. Right, Bob might be the pet squirrel and he ate a bunch of acorns or something. It doesn't really matter. So the idea again is the reason why we use punctuation is because it clarifies things uh, for us. Or it should if you have a good grasp on the, uh, on the grammar of the language. If you were ever wondering why uh, in your English classes your teachers and professors get really finicky about what you write, this is sort of why, right? Because if you screw up the punctuation, you end up saying entirely different things. And it's really important to, to get this correct. Uh, and what I mean by that is you have to learn that you should use the punctuation as opposed to not using it. So that when you are trying to express the idea that's in your head, you can meaningfully put it out there. Um, right, oh, so we have, uh, after that we have connectives. So words like and uh, are going to take these two things and what it's going to do is, what, is it's going to say that these two ideas are true. Say that both are true. Right? So you can't have one be true and the other one false, not when it's presented like this. Um, let's say we say something like uh, it's Sunday and it's raining. If it is Sunday, but it is not raining, then this statement as a whole, this whole thing, is false. Right? With a word like and, you need both of the both of the parts, or however many parts of it you have, they would all have to be true 
in order for the statement as a whole to be true. Uh, right, and then in, uh, let me check, what is this? This is uh, 3.2c, restrictive or non-restrictive clauses. This is actually a, a fairly important thing because you will see people screw this up in scientific studies um, all the time. Right, and the example that they give us is something like uh, the Japanese who eat a lot of fish are X. It doesn't matter what the X part is. Now, you have two ways of writing the sentence. One way is just like this, right? There is no punctuation. Uh, the other way is with punctuation. So without the punctuation, what you're saying is that uh, Japanese, uh, so people who are Japanese and they eat fish, or rather eat a lot of fish, are this X. But once you put in uh, those commas, then whatever is happening in between the commas is just sort of additional information. Right? It doesn't belong with the original term. So you get something like Japanese are X and they also uh, and then whatever came between the commas, right? Uh, we'll just call that Y. Right? That this part over here uh, is essentially relevant. You could have a sentence without it. Right? So this sentence here with the commas could actually be read as the Japanese are X. Uh, and you shouldn't be losing meaning. So again, punctuation comes in uh, pretty uh, heavily here to keep you from uh, having major problems. Uh, the last part, they have these uh, noun clauses and in fact they're talking about asserted and unasserted prop propositions. And uh, the idea is just something like this. Uh, depending on the words that we use, we are either making an assertion so we're saying that X is true or false, depending on how we phrase that. Or we are not making assertions. So uh, we'll call it a non-assertion. Um, and that's just not this, right? And here again, language becomes really, really sensitive. So if I say that a sentence like, Bob knows it is Sunday actually has a couple of things going on. Uh, the first part is that it is Sunday, so this has to be true. And then Bob knows stuff, right? So this has to be true. And then it must be true that this knowledge is related to this. Thing. So uh, you, you see how the sentences are really actually uh, sort of stacked ideas? Now, that works with knowledge, because as soon as you say that somebody knows something, the thing that they know has to be true. Uh, this, again, is logic. You can certainly screw this up uh, quite often. Uh, we can say the Greeks knew that the atom was not divisible. In other words, you couldn't break down an atom. And that was the Greek idea, that was their definition, and uh, they absolutely knew it. And uh, now we get an atom, and you can most definitely divide an atom, right? Electrons, protons, neutrons. So, it's that the, the Bob example here, it's a very nice sort of uh, logical setup. It tells you what the meaning of this statement is supposed to be. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily uh, ultimately true. But at least you know that it's supposed to carry a truth meaning to it. If I use 
Uh, so that, by the way, is an assertion. A non-assertion would be like Bob um, is convinced that uh, it's Sunday. Alright, so we have Bob, and Bob is convinced. And we have the idea of his conviction. The conviction is that it is Sunday, right? But we're not saying that this is true or false, right? What we're making a claim about is Bob's conviction. And in fact, we're saying this must be true. So, what the thing is that Bob is convinced about uh, doesn't really help us because we have no idea whether Bob's conviction is right or not. So we kind of drop that out. So the the only part where we're actually making an assertion is that Bob has a conviction, and that's about it, right? Or if we said that Bob uh, says that it's Sunday. Again, we don't know whether the it is Sunday part is true, but we do know that Bob said it, or that Bob argued it, or that, you know, uh, Bob is imagining. The problem with, uh, with statements like this is that these are sort of subjective, right? It's very hard to know that Bob is convinced or not, or that he is, uh, or that he believes a thing. Now, saying or arguing or something like that, that, that at least has a mechanical component. You can look out, you can see Bob arguing. But if we're just talking about what Bob believes, well, Bob's beliefs are in his head. So it's really difficult to, to nail that down. On the other hand, if we can phrase it in a different way, now we have, a, we have a whole thing going on. Now, just so you understand this thing about phrasing, so you don't just sort of jump to uh, additional conclusions. If we're writing about a fictional character like Bob, I, and so now I need to figure out what does Bob do, we need a verb over here, uh, about it being Sunday. Right, here's a statement. Well, if it is Sunday, then Bob can know that it is Sunday. If it is Sunday, but, I don't know, Bob hit his head and he doesn't know how long he's been passed out, then he might suspect that it's Sunday. Now, keep in mind that the word suspect is not a, an assertion. Right, it's uh, Bob's mental state of mind. But in order to, for Bob to know that it's Sunday, not only does Bob have to do some knowing, but Bob also has to have a decent reason to connect that. So for example, um, I don't know, take square root of 81. Uh, if you know what it is, as in you can explain to me why you have a conclusion for what it is and that conclusion is correct, then you know what the square root of 81 is. But if you look at it and you just sort of throw out a number, right, you just sort of guess, then you don't know what the square root of 81 is. Right? Do you understand the, uh, the point here? Unless you can explain why your answer is correct and the answer is also correct, you don't know. So if you just throw out a random number and you happen to guess correctly, then, you know, uh, whatever, Bob guessed that the square root of 81 is 9. All right. Um, so hopefully that has you, uh, that has you a little... Um, confused, it shouldn't be too bad. Uh, it's really just sort of uh, working out grammar and uh, and uh, sort of word order. So you can think of it this way. In, uh, in our chapter one, we sort of learn how to point at things. Right? 
that, that was their classification. Uh, in chapter two, we learned about uh, sort of uh, saying what it is. Right, that's definitions. So not only do I point at, uh, I don't know, at a squirrel, now I can say squirrel, and I could sort of tell you what I mean by squirrel, right? It's that little um, brownish gray thing with a fluffy tail running up a tree, chittering and eating acorns. And now in chapter three, uh, what we're doing is uh, we are We're worried about a question like, well, what is it doing? So first you point at a squirrel and uh, you make some sort of a, a noise. You can sort of imagine an infant here. And then they learn the word for squirrel. So then they can tell you like every time they see a squirrel, they just yell out squirrel, right? And they, they're probably still pointing. And then finally, you know, you learn to string together sentences and now you can tell me what the squirrel is doing, right? Or you can tell me something about the squirrel. You can say, the squirrel is in a tree, or the squirrel ran away, or the squirrel got hit by a bus. It doesn't really matter what, what the content is. It matters that there is a subject and there is a predicate which is going to sort of be affecting it. And that's, in essence, all that chapter three is. Uh, next chapter, which is about arguments, is going to be about sort of taking this sort of uh, set of statements that now we can say that something is true or false at this point, by the way. Uh, he's going to take that and we're going to sort of play around with it to see what else we can, in fact, do with that idea. Um, and how we use, essentially, uh, the propositions when we stack them together, they can give us new ideas out of them um, and what that does. All right. Uh, that's it. If you have questions or comments, leave it in the comments or shoot me an email, and I will see everybody uh, next week.